we're gonna turn the corner a little bit and discover if you're in shape. Are you in shape as a sheep? Um, some sheep are very lazy, <laughs> very, very lazy. And they forget what the Bible says. We are to discipline ourselves to godliness. And so they're not taking in the correct diet. Uh, they're taking in the prohibited diet. They're not being disciplined as they should. They're not willing to suffer. Uh, being a Christian is difficult. We must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, and so it's, it's challenging. And so we're going to turn the corner and look at these things, five things you must do to get in shape as a sheep. So if you would turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to look at verses 6 through 11, 6 through 11. They tell us it's estimated that 45 million Americans diet every year, and we spend, get this, you're going to fall over, $33 billion annually on weight loss products. Can you imagine taking that $33 billion and sending it to, you know, third world countries to help them or send some missionaries? In fact, it's crazy to think about all the diets that are out there that you and I are enticed to try. Perhaps you're considering the African mango diet, the alkaline diet, the Atkins diet, the baby food diet, the big breakfast diet, the biggest loser diet, the cabbage soup diet, the carb lovers diet, the caveman diet, the cookie diet, I'm going to go on that one, <laughs> the Dr. Oz diet, the Dr. Phil diet, eat more, weigh less diet, I want that one, eat what you love diet, fast food diet, flat belly diet, four day diet, fruit flush diet, the French woman diet, don't get fat diet, grapefruit diet, hallelujah diet. I went on that. My husband and I did. It's where you only uh, have carrot juice and greens gag and fruits and vegetables. And my husband said, I know why you call this a hallelujah diet, because when you're done, it's hallelujah. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, when he was preaching, his, his hands were orange, and I was like, okay, it's time to go off this diet. <laughs> and uh, but we, we did that one. We did that one for 16 months, and my hair started falling out. And I thought, well, I don't think it's a good idea. The HG, HGG diet, the high school reunion diet, the Jenny Craig diet, Kind diet, LA weight loss diet, the lemonade diet, Martha's Vineyard diet, Mayo Clinic diet, morning banana diet, Nutrisystem diet, O2 diet, Park Avenue diet, the raspberry ketone diet, the raw food diet, rice diet, 17 day diet, Shangri La diet, skinny vegan diet, slim fast diet, South Beach diet, sugar buster diet, thin for life diet, this is why you're fat diet. I know why I'm fat diet. I don't need to go on that diet. The three-day diet, the three-hour diet. I want to go on that one. Three hours, that sounds great. <laughs> what color is your diet? My sister went on that one one time, and I said, what's the what color? She goes, what, one day you eat only yellow food, and the next day you eat orange food and red food. I was like, what? <laughs> Way down diet, Weight Watchers diet, Wheat Belly diet, you're on a diet, and the zone diet. Now, ladies, I didn't even mention half the diets out there. That's ridiculous, isn't it? And so maybe along with your new diet plan, you're going to start exercising your body. And you're considering ab buster, aerobics, ballet, bicycling, bodybuilding, boot camp, bowling, boxing, crunches, dancing, dumbbells, elliptic training, frog hops. What's a frog hop? Hula hooping, isometrics, insanity, jogging, jumping rope, lunges, mountain climbing, Pilates, push-ups, pull-ups, quad stretches, rowing, running, sit-up, skating, sledding, tire flipping, tire flipping, walking, water aerobics, weight lifting, or Zumba. Now... This list is even more ridiculous. This list I just read you are, is only 10% of the exercise programs out there. Now, as ridiculous, and those are ridiculous, how I, as we start, I want to ask you, how much time do you spend on dieting and exercise in your physical life compared to your spiritual life? Have you come to the conference this weekend only to find out you're in worse shape spiritually than you are physically? How many of you find yourself spending less time with God in prayer and in his word and more time in things that lead to vain pursuits? How many of you vacate worship for worldly vanities? Ladies, we need to go to boot camp for sure, but it's not the boot camp the world has to offer. It's the boot camp the word has to offer. And we're going to consider five things that you must do to get in shape as a sheep. 
and they are not eat less, exercise more, take vitamins, eliminate stress, and get more sleep. That's what the world says. We're going to consider five things you need to get in shape spiritually as a sheep. So let's listen in as Paul writes in 1 Timothy 4, 6 to 11. Notice what he writes. He says, if you put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you shall be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine, unto which you have attained. But refuse profane and old wives' tables, but rather exercise yourself unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. For to this end we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust we trust in the living God who is the savior of all men especially of those who believe these things command and teach now ladies before we get into the text we all know that Paul says in another place that the Christian life is a race we're all running a race and he says don't you know that those who run in a race only one receives the prize and he encourages the church at Corinth to run in a race that is, is temperate run in a race to obtain a perishable uh, not an imperishable crown but a perishable crown and he also talks about the fact that he beats his body into subjection why? so that he isn't disqualified, so that he doesn't suffer a shipwreck. Paul is, you know what Paul is saying? I fear apostasy. I fear if I don't beat my body into subjection spiritually, I myself will be like Hymenaeus and Alexander. I will suffer a shipwreck. And so as we consider getting into spiritual shape, we're going to consider five things we must do to run this race. First of all, we're going to look at the proper diet for the runner, the prohibited diet for the runner, the profitable discipline for the runner, the painful demands of the runner, and the passionate directives for the runner. Let's consider, first of all, what he says about the proper diet. Ladies, just as in the, in the, you know, we talked last night about doctrines of demons and making sure that we're not making a, a food an issue, but we all know that we do feel better, right? <laughs> if we eat right. And just like in the physical realm, if you want to be healthy, uh, you need to eat right. So it is in the spiritual realm. If you want to be a healthy Christian, you have to be on a proper diet. What is that? Notice what he says. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Notice the word he uses. Nourished in the words of faith and good doctrine. So Paul starts by saying, Timothy, instruct the brethren in these things. Keep it before their mind's eye. And so the question might come to your mind, what things? What things is Timothy supposed to keep in front of the people's Minds. Well, we don't have time to get into everything, but everything he's already said, uh, the dangers of getting up in, uh, getting caught up in false teachers, making sure that you're not suffering a shipwreck, making sure that you're waging war against sin. And ladies, we need to be reminded of these things too. We need to be instructing each other in these things. In fact, probably more uh, we do than the church at Ephesus. We need to make sure that we're no longer children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Ladies, today, it's discouraging, honestly, to see all the junk out there and how we, even women, many women, gravitate to, oh, that sounds good, let's follow this, let's do this, let's do this. They're not nourished in Scripture, but they sure are caught away by every wind of doctrine. And Paul goes on to say, if you keep instructing them, Timothy, you're going to be a good minister, which means you're noble, you're excellent. Did you catch what Paul said? You're going to be a good minister. But you know, today, if we have somebody that gets up and speaks truth, what do they say? You're judgmental, you're a legalist, you're, you're too religious, you're, you know, you're archaic. Who are you to judge false teachers? Who are you to judge false teaching? You know, many well-meaning Christians will say we shouldn't confront these things. We need to show love by being tolerant and silent. Ladies, this verse would certainly do away with such nonsense. We're to defend the truth. We're to contend for the faith. People who teach the Bible should confront and refute those who teach false doctrine. And yet when we do, you know what we're termed? Judgmental. 
You're judgmental, Susan. You're this, you're that. Well, I'm just trying to teach what the Bible says. <laughs> what does the Bible say? Titus says, hold fast to the faithful word that you have been taught so you may be able by sound doctrine both to refute the, and confute those who contradict you. Ladies, we are good ministers if we aim to please the Lord and not please men. We must defend truth and we must speak out against error. This is for the Lord's glory. I don't know how many songs we just sang this morning that talked about, I, it really was emphasized to me as we were singing this morning. I hope you're paying attention when you sing, that you're not just singing words, that you're really worshiping the Lord. But did you notice how many times we sang something about wanting to glorify the Lord? Be glorified, be glorified, be glorified. Well, ladies, we're not going to glorify the Lord by keeping our mouths shut and not defending the 66 letters he's written to us, right? This is his word. We cannot compromise it. One man said this, the failure to think biblically and theologically has cost the church dearly. It's allowed the infiltration of all sorts of error. That in turn has led to the churches becoming confused and weak. Convictionless preaching consisting of watered down teaching, platitudes and weak theology has replaced doctrinally strong expositional preaching. The resulting legacy has been one of the charismatic confusions, psychological encroachment, mysticism, and even psychic and occult influence. Much of that chaos can be attributed directly to the failure of pastors to think critically and preach with conviction. So many pastors have failed to draw the line clearly between truth and error and build up their people in the rich and sound doctrine of God's word. Such weak preachers are often said to compensate by having what some call a pastor's heart. A pastor's heart, however, is not measured by how good a man is petting his sheep, but by how well he protects them from the wolves and feeds them so they can grow to be mature and strong, end of quote. Ladies, I praise God for pastors who will stand truth. I thank God for my husband of 46 years, never compromised his convictions. We need men like that today. We need women like that today who will be like Timothy, as Paul is telling Timothy, contend for the faith. Now, why would instructing these believers regarding doctrines of demons and seducing spirits make Timothy a good minister of Jesus? Notice what he says. You'll be nourishing them in the words of faith and good doctrine. Timothy, this is their nourishment as a sheep. They need sound teaching, not the doctrines of demons, not the doctrines of seducing spirits. In fact, the word nourishing means here to constantly nourish yourself. Timothy, constantly nourish them. Ladies, I hope every day you spend time in the Word, and I hope you spend massive amounts of time in Scripture. But you know what? Tomorrow you're going to need to spend, more, spend some more time in Scripture. We need to be constantly nourishing ourselves in the Word of God. We need to be like the godly man in Psalm 1 who meditates day and night. It's always on our mind. It's like that in the physical realm too, right? You ate this morning, or some of you may have eaten, but you know when we get done here in a little bit, you're going to be hungry again, right? And then guess what? You're going to be hungry again later. And some of you eat all day, you know, and you have to eat to sustain your physical life. You have to eat his words to sustain your spiritual life. Ladies, if you don't nourish yourself, you'll be malnourished and you'll die. You will die and you won't be able to wage war against sin. So what is the proper diet for a runner if you're taking notes? The words of faith and good doctrine. The words of faith and good doctrine. And ladies, again, it's not doctrines of demons. The word of faith would be the body of God's truth. All 66 books. I am shocked at the number of Christian women I meet. As Debbie and I now have been traveling for about 25 years. I am shocked at the number of women I meet that tell me they've never read Genesis through Revelation. They, you know, they open their Bible and read a verse here and a verse there. Ladies, how can we be nourished? How can we be satisfied with the dribble of God's word? How can we survive? <laughs> you can't. We should be taking in massive amounts of scripture. I remember starting discipling a girl uh, about six months ago, and she'd never read through her Bible. And, and I said, why don't you just start with Genesis, and we'll just talk about it. So uh, our second phone call, she goes, Miss Susan. 
did you know about Cain and Abel? Wow, you just know what I just learned. And I was like, I was like I, uh, yeah, I've been reading that for many years now. But it was just like, I was like, take up your Bible and read it. It's amazing how it'll nourish you and strengthen you and comfort you and convict you and help you. Ladies, how can we survive without sound doctrine? In fact, the words good or sound doctrine would come from sound theology, which comes from the right study and interpretation of God's word. So ladies, it takes time. You can't just glance at a verse and shut your Bible and think you're going to get through the day. We're to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. In fact, James talks about the man who, who stoops down and peers into the mirror of God's word and they stay there for a while. They study it. They look intently into it. I know well-meaning women who nourish themselves spiritually in Christian romance novels, devotional literature, and I feel sad for them. You know what's going to happen when adversity comes? Their strength will fail. They will not make it. They will not make it. They're not strong in the faith. They haven't nourished their spiritual muscles in the meat of God's word. They're still, as Howard Hendricks said, they're still crawling around in their spiritual diapers. <laughs> they haven't grown up. An interesting side note is Timothy's mother and grandmother taught in the scriptures, right? From a child you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Ladies, this behooves us as mothers, as grandmothers. We need to be pouring into our children, pouring into our grandchildren. Get your children memorizing books of the Bible. They can do it better than you can do it, believe me. I know a little girl in our church, five years old. She memorized the epistle of James. She got up and quoted it one Sunday, word perfect. Get these kids memorizing them. Nourish them, not just, not just physically, but spiritually. In fact, the spiritual is far more important, right? It's far more important. I remember several years ago, I was doing a conference and a lady wrote me later and she goes, I was really convicted at your message. I don't know what it was, but anyway, she said, you know, I, I was really convicted of pride. And she said, I was using my nursing time to check all my likes on my Facebook and how many people were liking what I posted. And it was just puffing me up and the pride of life was creeping in. And she said, after your message, I decided I'd start using my nursing time to memorize scripture. And she said, so I'm memorizing 10 verses a day now. So I emailed her back and I said, you know what? That baby girl will far benefit, far greater from your memorization of God's word than you're checking your Facebook page to see how many people liked your post. Ladies, we need to be nourishing not only ourselves, but our children as well. The body is going to decay, but the soul will live forever, right? Either in heaven or hell. And ladies, I would encourage you to be instructing your children in the word. Timothy knew he must not let the busyness of life and the distractions of the age keep him from one thing that is needful. And ladies, we have to do the same because we are tempted. We are tempted with all the distractions of our age, blogs, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. And we substitute that for meaningful time in the scriptures. I'm afraid many of you are going to suffer a shipwreck if that's your mantra in life. Well, Timothy, being a good minister, not only nourished himself in good doctrine, but he carefully followed it, which means he closely followed sound doctrine. The word here, he's, he conformed to it like a pattern that you would trace on a material. I remember when I was in high school, I took a home ec class. I don't know why, but anyway, we sewed, uh, we made aprons or something, and you know, we had to take a tracing, it was like a wheel. I don't, do you even do that anymore? I don't sew, but anyway, you know, I remember like tracing the exact pattern and for some reason, my garment didn't turn out like I was supposed to. I was like, I'm not wearing that thing. But, but the idea, that's what he's saying. Trace sound doctrine so that you look exactly like it. Look just like the pattern that you trace on material. Ladies, I wish we would carefully follow sound doctrine because I feel many our day are carelessly following novel ideas. So we move from the proper diet for the runner to the prohibited diet for the runner in verse 7. What should a sheep who's running the spiritual race avoid? Notice what he says in verse 7. Reject profane and old wives' fables. Reject it. The word but is a word of contrast. In contrast to sound doctrine, to faith, to good doctrine, that's the proper nourishment, you are prohibited from profane and old wives' tables. In fact, the word reject is a strong word. It means refuse it, don't pay attention to it, don't waste your time with it, have nothing to do 
with profane and old wives' fables. It's very similar to what Paul says in 2 Timothy, shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Profane means they're wicked, they're heathen. Old wise fables would be fables or tales that are not founded upon facts. They're tales that women think are important. And they tell us in the biblical world, because women weren't encouraged to study the word of God, that often they would just get, back, get with each other, and women do this today. They like to get together and just talk about stupid stuff, right? Um, most women that I meet say, I hate women's conferences. I said, I do too, most of them. Not, not, you know, because most of them are just a bunch of wasted time. They're a bunch of wasted time. But women would get, back, get together in the biblical world, and they would gossip back and forth, and they would share things that were not true, just fables and profane things. And as I said, they were not encouraged to study the Word of God, but they would get caught up in foolish nonsense. That's why Paul says the young women are to marry, bear children, rule the house, give no occasion for the adversary to speak reproachfully. And he talks about some who have given over to Satan. They wander from house to house talking about things they shouldn't be talking about. And ladies, we have a, a other ways of doing that today. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, texting. We have more, many more ways of how we get involved in idle chatter. Ladies, we're going to be held accountable for that, for gossiping and slandering and telling things that are not true. My sister, we have so many privileges in our world that the older women of old, Old Testament, New Testament did not have. We have resources for Bible study, good sermons. There's no excuse for such silliness in our day. Instead of being involved in such nonsense, Paul says, exercise yourself to godliness. Uh, the word exercise means discipline yourself. The Greek word is gymnazo. We get our English word, what? Gymnasium. Some of you like to, you know, go work out in the gym or do gymnastics. It's exercise, isn't it? <laughs> and the word godliness is piety or right conduct. The readers would understand what Paul's writing about because in the biblical world, the Olympics were a big deal. <laughs> They were a big deal, the Olympic Games. In fact, they tell us, even in our day and age, it takes four to eight years of discipline training to get ready for the Olympics. In fact, it involves many hours, six days a week of grueling training to be involved in the Olympics. And Paul says we're to exercise ourselves, not to be in the Olympics, <laughs> but godliness. But godliness Ladies, discipline is hard work. And I would encourage you, as an older woman talking to most of you that are younger than me, don't be guilty of setting ungodly examples by getting caught up in foolish chatter and the nonsense of our day. Set godly examples by being disciplined, a disciplined, godly woman. In fact, several years ago, I was at a church, and it was a, I'm not going to tell you what church it was, because I'm not going to gossip, but it was a church I was looking forward to going to, and I was excited, and Deb and I were going to go out with the ministry team that night, and I was excited, because I wanted to learn from them, and talk about women's ministry, and how to excel, and make it better, and, and anyway, there was about 10 of us, and we went to a restaurant in, in town, and we were there about two or three hours, and the whole two or three hours we were there, they talked about some diet that the whole church was on and how much weight they had lost collectively. And uh, they were looking at the menu, well, we can't have this, but we can eat this, we can't have this. And I, was, and I was like, okay, well, and I remember trying to change the conversation. We got, Deb and I got back to the hotel room and I said, you know what I wanted to say, but I didn't, I practiced self-control. I wanted to say, are you guys this passionate about the gospel? I didn't, but you know what? When I got back home, I was telling one of my mentors uh, who disciples me, she's 90, almost 90, she'll be 90 in November. Her name's Carolyn. She's from Georgia, even though she lives in Oklahoma. So I was telling her about my experience, and she said, Susan, the next time that happens, that's exactly what I want you to say. Are you this passionate about the gospel? You know, so... Uh, yeah, she's something else. I remember one Sunday since Doug passed, I kind of had a meltdown at church. And uh, anyway, I came and sat next to her. She's lost two husbands. She said, basically, you need to get yourself under control here. I was like, okay, I will. <laughs> so anyway, but uh, I thought, I left there and I was like, wow, what a wasted three hours talking about some stupid. They probably, all of them gained all that weight they collectively have lost. 
They're now fatter than they ever used to be, probably, so. I love what Charles Spurgeon says. What does it matter, after all, to have a possessed, a healthy body if you have a perishing soul? What does it matter? Well, Paul goes on to write why godliness is a thing the good Christian runner pursues. Look at the profitable discipline for the runner. He said bodily exercise profits a little. And so, ladies, Paul's not condemning exercise. Um, I try to walk every day. I don't always get to. But, you know, pro exercise does profit a little. And the athletes in Paul's day were just as obsessed with their bodies as we are in our day. And Paul's not condemning exercise. It does have some benefit. It does have some advantage. But ladies, when you're gone, <laughs> you're gone, right? Even the Mayo Clinic will tell you there are benefits of exercise. Number one, it controls your weight. Number two, it combats, it combats health conditions and diseases. Number three, it improves your mood. Number four, it boosts your energy. Number five, it promotes better sleep. Number seven, exercise is fun. What? I don't, I don't know. I do enjoy walking outside. But ladies, as good as exercise is for your body, there's an exercise that is of eternal value. In contrast to bodily exercise, there's an exercise that is profitable in this life and the life to come, and it's called godliness. Godliness. Discipline. One man says this, godly people are always disciplined people. It's always been so. Call to mind some heroes of church history. Augustine, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Bunyan, Susanna Wesley, George Whitfield, Lady Huntingdon, Jonathan, Sarah Edwards, Charles Spurgeon, George Mueller. They were all disciplined people. He says, in my own pastoral and personal Christian experience, I can say I've never known a man or a woman who came to spiritual maturity except through discipline. Godliness comes through discipline, end of quote. Ladies, Paul says discipline is profitable, not only for this life, but the life to come. It's profitable now, your home life, your marriage, your work life, your play, your church, everything. And ladies, it's profitable for discernment. If you want to be a discerning woman, discern truth from error, you need to be disciplined. So the profitable discipline for the runner, if you're taking notes, is not going to the gym to work out, but it's godliness. Godliness. And ladies, godliness, discipline does not come easy. You don't get it by osmosis. It's painful. <laughs> it's painful. So now we turn to the painful demands of the runner. Look at verse 9 and 10. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. Just in case some of you right now are like Paul's readers. Uh-uh, this is too hard. Uh, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not buying this stuff, Paul. And Timothy, I'm not going to buy it from you either. <laughs> nope. Paul says, you better listen up. What I'm saying is true, and it's right, and it needs to be accepted, and it needs to be followed. And then he says in verse 10, for to this end, we both labor and suffer reproach. Ladies, runners are always reaching for the goal, the prize to win the race. So we as believers, we press toward the prize for the high calling in Christ Jesus. Paul puts it like this, to this end, this is the reason, this is why we labor. This is why we suffer reproach. Ladies, these are the painful demands of the runner of Jesus. In fact, labor and reproach are both athletic terms. Labor means to work hard to the point of exhaustion, feeling fatigued. My friend, a lazy Christian is not a godly Christian. Suffer here means to agonize, fight, labor fervently. These two terms are not describing the physical exercise of a Christian, but the spiritual exercise, the labor and the toil that is involved when you work for the kingdom. It's hard. It's difficult. I know. <laughs> I know. It's hard. It's difficult. And many times you incur persecution and hatred, even from within people in the flock. <laughs> That's where I found most of my persecution comes from, not from the world. It's from people that claim to be sheep, right? Jesus says, woe when all men speak well of you. You're going to be hated. You're going to be persecuted. Through the years as I've done various interviews for certain people, many of that I have called out as false teachers, it's interesting. What I say about them is their, victim, their uh, followers are just like them. They're mean, they're vicious, 
And you know what? Pretty soon I'll get phone calls, people wishing me to go to hell, people wanting to kill me, uh, people demanding I apologize, and it proves my point. <laughs> the sheep become like those who follow, right? Even if they're following a false shepherd. But anymore, I'm like, oh, well, whatever. <laughs> Just let it roll off my back. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of heaven. Strive to enter at the narrow gate. It's constricted. It's hard. Hard. But it's the way to eternal life. Ladies, these are not tickle your ear phrases, but my dear sister, the joy of knowing the Lord and the blessing of being his child forever outweighs any difficulty in this life. The sufferings of this life are not worthy to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed in us. You might be saying, well, Susan, this is just a little crazy for me. I mean, Paul, he must be a masochist. He's sick in the head. He needs a psychiatrist. <laughs> he thinks this is a good life of a runner. Paul would beg to differ with you as he says, we do these things. Why? Because we trust in the living God. We hope in the living God, who's the savior of all men. What does the psalmist say? I would have lost heart unless I believed in the land of the living, that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Ladies, this is our hope. This is our joy. This is our abundant life. This isn't the only life now. This isn't your best life not now, as Joel Olstein says. <laughs> the life to come in eternity. In fact, my husband used to say that he thought our first response when we get to heaven will be laughter because why did we hold on to this? And so at the end of his service, it said, may your laughter fill the halls of heaven. So uh, I'm, I don't know if that was his first response or not, but why did we hold on to this when we can have that? And then Paul says he's a savior of all men. And no, Paul is not a universalist. Paul does not think that all men will be saved. He's the deliverer of all men. He's a savior of all men. He saves all kinds of men. If you, We don't have time to get back into chapter 2, but he talks about kings and slaves and servants. and He's talking about all types of men. And he does give common grace to all, right? He sends rain on the unjust, uh, the just and the unjust. He causes his, sh his son to rise on the evil and the good. But to those who believe, he gives special grace, the grace of eternal life, which is our prize, <laughs> a trophy that will not rot away but an inheritance that won't fade. But he also gives a lot of other gifts. The gift of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, self-control. That's a gift, right? So what should runners do with all this? Should we put it up, this information on a jump drive and refer to it every now and then? No. A good runner will keep these things, not keep these things to himself, but pass them on. So let's close by looking at the passionate directives for the runner. Verse 11. These things command and teach. Paul says, Timothy, teach them, instruct them, and command them. Explain these things, Timothy. Don't be timid, Timothy. Be courageous. Be bold. Speak the truth. Guard the truth. Defend the truth. And pound them in. Command means to pound them in to other people. Pass the baton on to the younger generation so they can run the race for the eternal prize. So what is the proper diet for the runner? The words of faith and good doctrine. Are you nourishing yourself on the junk food the world has to offer, the food that's gonna burn up? Do you listen to the false teachers of our day or do you reject them as Paul tells Timothy to do? My friend, all these things that you waste valuable time on are going to burn up. Or are you nourishing yourselves in the words of God? How much nourishment have you fed yourself this week? How much time have you spent in the Word? Included in that would be study time as well, so you can understand sound doctrine. Secondly, the prohibited diet for the runner is profane and old wives' tales. Are you partaking of all the stuff out there that women gravitate to? Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, I can't even keep up with all the stuff out there. Shopping, meddling in other people's business when you should be feasting on the riches of Christ? How much time do you spend in trivial pursuits compared to time you spend in the Word and with other believers in fulfilling the Great Commission? What is the profitable discipline for the runner? It's godliness. My dear friend, God will have no other idols before him, even if it's your body. How much time do you spend on disciplining your earthly body in comparison to disciplining yourself to godliness? 
Why do we spend so much time on a body that is going to turn to ashes when we could be spending time on our soul that will be with our Lord forever? What are the painful demands of a runner to labor and suffer reproach? Are you running the race avoiding the difficult pain that is involved? Are you laboring to the point of exhaustion for the king? Are you suffering for the gospel's sake? Have you lost family members and good friends because of your stand for truth? And the passionate directives are to command and teach these things. Are you taking the truths that you know and pounding them into someone else? Teaching someone else? Who are the ones that you're pouring your life into? Who will you pass the baton to when you step out of this life into eternal life? Well, it's been said that Americans have more food to eat than any other people in the world, and yet we have more diets to keep us from eating it. I would add to that, Christians have more resources and privileges for study and meaningful time in the Word, and yet we have more and more distractions to keep us from knowing it. What is it going to be for you, my friend, in 2022? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for 66 rich letters you've left to us, such green pastures for us as sheep. And we claim to be among the flock. We claim to know you, but, oh Lord, how little time we spend in nourishing our souls. I do pray, Father, that you would move in our hearts, that you would help us to lay aside the distractions of this world, what looks like a greener pasture somewhere else. It could be some worldly vain pursuit or even a person, well-meaning friend. But Lord, pray that the most needful thing that we would do would be what you told Martha that Mary was doing, to sit at your feet and learn. She chose the good part. And I pray that these dear, precious sisters would do the same, to choose the good thing, the excellent thing, and that is to nourish himself in the green pastures of your word. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.